Welcome all you multifamily maniacs to the deal lab. I'm Dr. Heath Jones. And I'm Hutch, the Marine Investor. Hutch, today we have such an exciting show. Oh man, I've, I've been following this guy ever since he came through my feed in LinkedIn. And uh, I'm just a huge fan. I was telling him this before we got started. And I'm just super excited today. So yeah, so you're absolutely right, man. Jerome, real, real good guy. We've networked him with him for a while. And you know, I'm definitely looking forward to this episode. It's going to be exciting stuff. Excellent. Well, our guest today is a self-proclaimed corporate America dropout who is helping others exit the matrix through ownership and multifamily workforce housing. After building a $20 million division at a construction company and having to lay off his teammates two years in a row, he had enough and decided to become a full-time real estate entrepreneur. He now works with investors in two main ways. One, he has real estate education that helps people exit the matrix through one-on-one -on -one coaching. And two, uh, he purchases and fixes broken apartment complexes through joint ventures. Uh, he created the Myers Methods of Multifamily Investing after becoming educated himself through the School of Hard Knocks and uses it to operate his business's portfolio in the mid-Atlantic area every day. He is the host of two podcasts, which is just crazy. Just doing one is nuts, but two podcasts. The first is Dream Catchers, and the other is Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. So you definitely need to go check out these podcasts. They're amazing. Uh, you can find out more about our guest and go get you their free report that reveals insider secrets to multifamily unit investing at MyersMethods.com. And you can also find out how you can work with him by visiting uh, developing.com, but with the E's as threes. So D3V3LOPING.com. <laughs> We'd like to welcome Mr. Jerome Myers. How are you doing today, sir? I'm looking around trying to figure out who's going to come out and talk to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what Hutch always says is, you did that, man. That, that's, that's you right there. Oh, we appreciate you coming on. Ex excited. It's a, it's a glorious Friday. Good start to the day. Do you have a, a real estate quote or mantra that drives you? Yeah, my favorite one right now is stop trying to catch Moby Dick on your first deal. I think there is so <laughs> trying to get into space, and they don't have any experience operating, and they want to go take down this huge deal on their first one. And I just want you guys to go catch them for tuna, get them in the boat, get used to operating a little bit, get a little bit of track record, and then go get other people's money and scale off of that. But I want people to have some experience before they go big. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You, you know, a lot of times uh, you go to these conferences and I remember after uh, leaving uh, the first one I went to, I was like, well, dang, I got to quit my job in the next two weeks and go find a 400 unit apartment to buy. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I felt like I needed to do because of all the information that was being put out at the, the place. So I like that. Yeah. Don't go after Moby Dick. Learn how to fish first. <laughs> yeah. Shoot. So Jerome, so we talk a lot, a lot about your business and buying stuff. Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit more about yourself? Sorry. I was trying to use my space bar as the mute <laughs> thing. It didn't Sounds work. Good the beeping and stuff but you know look man i love you guys because you you serve our country right i'm the son of a soldier and a stay-at-home mom my dad was in the marines for a few years met my mom got out and then went back into the army and was 82nd airborne for the rest of his career and so coming from that background i didn't have a lot of exposure to a ton of wealthy people and you know just business owners or anything like that so i got told to get good grades go to a good school get a good job, get married, have kids, just follow the traditional line that many people are taught. And it was, as I was going along the path, I was doing all the things, I was checking all the boxes, doing it all in the right order, but I still felt empty, right? It was just like, okay, something else has gotta be more. And so I started asking some really defiant questions and where it ended, landed me was in this really high paying job where I didn't really feel like I was having a ton of impact on the world. And I distinctly remember flying over a football field on a Friday night because I used to coach football when I had more individual contributor roles instead of leadership roles and seeing kids playing and thinking I really had an impact when I was doing that. And I traded that for an extra $600 a month. 
that doesn't really make sense in the grand scheme of things. And so I started challenging myself and what I was doing. And after laying folks off for a couple of years in a bigger role, I said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm really going to get back to base. And so what that looked like was me going back to a conversation I had on a student with my friend Duran in college. And we were doing the math because that's what every engineering student does in their free time. I, I was paying three ninety five. dollars uh, We had two roommates apiece. They were paying three ninety five, dollars And so when you multiply that across the complex, the guy was making seven hundred grand a year. We never talked to him. We never seen him. And we were like, we want to do this, but we just didn't know how. Right. We didn't know anybody that owned an apartment complex. And so when I walked out of corporate America, I went and started knocking on the doors of banks and said, hey, I got a deal. Don't you want to give me a million dollars so I can go buy this? And <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I've got all the things. Right. I got a credit score. I got money. It's like you don't have experience. I said, well, I just built a 20 million dollar business. Yeah. So what? I got an MBA. Yeah, we don't care about that either. Project management professional, professional engineer. Any of these certifications matter? No. You need to sign a loan where you executed a similar business plan for a property of similar size, then we'll lend you money. We don't invest in your dreams. We invest in proven business plans and people who have a track record of successful execution. And so I was back to the same place I was. I didn't know anybody, right? So I started fixing and flipping houses and eventually I met the guy who had experience and I was able to get in my first deal as a joint venture and we've been trucking ever since. <laughs> Boom, oh, man, man. Let, let, let's dissect that a, that a little bit, man. Um, so the, the traditional way of thinking or the traditional way of, um, yeah, the American dream, right? Get a good education, but it seems as if, right? Um, good education paid off for you is just the, the fulfillment that was not felt um, um, during, during that, that job or the corporate American, right? Well, because, without question, like yeah. I, I use everything that I learned in college. Well, maybe not right. You know, <laughs> virtual equations, but I, I still use a lot of the stuff that I learned in college and what I learned through my corporate career. But you know, what I was applying it against wasn't a problem that I was really interested in solving. The problem that I want to solve is making sure that uh, teachers, police officers, firefighters have quality housing, right? It's a atrocity that the people who have the biggest impact in our world and are keeping us safe don't have great housing. And so we're working on the workforce housing crisis that we have here in America. Oh man. That's and that, that's, that's beautiful, man. <laughs> that's beautiful. So um, during college, you find the true value of real estate, right? Um, so even though you, can, you didn't figure it out yet, you eventually come back to it. And then that, that, that is amazing. Yeah. Now, I, I, I kind of thought the same thing whenever, I, whenever I was younger, I was like, man, it'd be cool to have to own an apartment building because people pay you each month. And then that was like a one off idea I had when I was younger. And I never even thought about it for the next 18 years <laughs> until, you know, I was like, oh man, I need to make some more money quick. How do I do that? Google, how do I make more money quick? And it was like all these, you know, start a blog, start a YouTube channel. I'm like, I don't want to do that. And there's like real estate. I'm like, real estate makes sense. And so, uh, and then I was like, oh yeah, people pay you each month. That, that makes sense. So that's true. incredible. At least uh, they pay you every month. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. That's, that's, that's the expectation, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's one thing I learned real quick with my first, uh, multifamily purchase was the difference between physical occupancy and actual economic occupancy. <laughs> I had four people who were taking up space, but hadn't paid in two or three months. So <laughs> Uh, and I inherited that that headache, um, and that doesn't really show up on the rent roll as well if they stop keeping track of it because they know that the property is going for sale. <laughs> and stop keeping track of it because the property was going to sell. They stopped keeping track of it so they could tell you they didn't have it. Uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh man. So for for the most part, uh, Hutch and I have been focusing on scaling our uh, multifamily portfolios, but we've been. Uh, focusing on acquiring these assets uh, through syndications, but you focus on a different approach. And so I wanted to see if you could walk us through the difference between uh, a syndication and a joint venture. Yeah, the best way I've found to explain this is when you think about a syndication, think about going to jump on a jumbo jet, right? You're at the airport, you got your ticket, you give it to the lady, she scans it, you walk down the breezeway, you get on the plane, 
the stewardess waves at you, the co-pilot and co-pilot smile at you, give you the thumbs up, and then you go sit in your seat. And now you're along for the ride, right? That's what mm -hmm. a limited partner does on a syndication. The people that are in the general partnerships, the lady scanning the ticket, uh, the steward, stewardess, and the pilots, they're getting paid to be there, right? And so they are the general partners, they're the people doing the work. And depending on which side of the general partnership or the limited partnership you sit, uh, you either are putting money in and not getting dollar for dollar on your equity, or you're putting some sweat in in order to get compensated for your participation in the project. In the joint venture, think about it like a fighter jet. And I want to be a fighter pilot when I was a kid, right? But everybody's got a job, right? There aren't any people just going along for the ride. Everybody's either looking for bad guys or shooting or they're flying a jet, whatever it is, there's, there's an active role for everybody. And so, I personally want to work with, you know, super sharp people who have some capital to invest and we can go take down these deals and they can have a say more so than somebody who just, you know, sends a check in as if this is a stock or bond. Oh man. So does that mean if, uh, so in the process of finding people to partner with, if there was someone who wanted to take a more passive role and not be an active uh, participant, how, how do you manage uh, those relations or, or including those people on your business plan? I don't. I send them to the people who are syndicators, right? I mean, right. there are some instances where we will work with a um, limited partner, but that's in deals that are in the future. We're working on a development deal that will probably syndicate. But, you know, the deals that we've done so far, they've always been joint ventures and it's always everybody's got some form of active role in the project. And we just like that because now the focus isn't solely on how much money we can make for the deal, but we can make adjustments along the way and make sure that we're improving the community. Because again, the people that we're targeting, they're usually living in substandard conditions and we need to do things in order to improve them. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that because like you said, if you have a, uh, people who, you know, your LPs that own 75, 80% of the equity and they're expecting a particular amount or, or and it's legally, you know, they're, they're supposed to get this amount according to a legal uh, private placement memorandum, a PPM, that now you are more driven by making sure you meet those numbers to stay in compliance than you are saying, hey, you guys, can we can we take a little cut, you know, over the next quarter so that we can actually make these units better than what they are currently? That that's that's I hadn't ever thought about JVs from that uh, perspective. So I I think that's a great that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, I mean, one of my one of my biggest partners, and he's been a partner in every deal that we've done. I mean, the whole reason why he wanted to get into the business is so that his investments would make an impact. Right. And it's not just about maximizing dollar or profit to the shareholder as if we're a Fortune 500 company. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, I was on a call this morning right before we jumped on and we were talking about, hey, is it time to sell? Do we want to refi? What do we want to do with this property? I don't think that LPs actually get to have that conversation just on a phone call with, you know, a few of the people that they partner with. It's a much bigger ordeal and depending on how their deal is structured they might not have a say in it at all anyway and i think there's one thing that i like to touch on heath that you mentioned and that was you know there's a legally binding document you cannot promise a return right you can say that you're going to get x as a preferred return but if the property doesn't actually generate that there is no guarantee that is why the sec is right. so strict on the the compliance piece of it and they differentiate between sophisticated and accredited because there is real risk. Will the property or the value of the investment go to zero? More than likely not because you've got hard real estate on the backside of it. But with that said, you know, the risk capital, that top of the equity stack, you know, that 25 to maybe 20%, depending on how you do it. I guess some people are going down to 35% in equity now. Um, you know, you could lose all of that if you lost the property and had foreclosure or short sale or something like that. Right, right. Yeah, so th th there's definitely risk risk on, on, on all sides, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so for the joint, joint venture, obviously that would, because you're not raising capital from other passive investor, right, or LP, limited partners, 
Um, what are some of the what are some of the the financial step you would advise someone take before they actually get into a joint venture deal? Oh man, it's like getting married, right? I mean, <laughs> you want to know you want to know the folks really well because you know for the deals that we've done so far, like we bought them all with recourse debt, right? So that we could actually keep the business plan with the expectation that we would either sell or refinance into non recourse debt, and you know. Some people are like, well, why would you do that? Why would you do a recourse debt? Well, one, I believe that you can, there's prepayment penalties and a bunch of other stuff that goes into the recourse debt where they're trying to make sure that they get a specific amount of interest while you have the property. And if you're not sure where the market's going to be or um, whether or not you want to keep the asset, you could get in real trouble. And I've seen that happen where people have brief, done a deal ready to sell, they've got these prepayment penalties and they want the buyers to come in to pay those prepayment penalties. And so they can't sell the deal because nobody's willing to pay those fees for them. And I mean, there's a number of other examples on why I don't recommend going into the recourse debt initially. And what, but the other thing that I'm uncomfortable with is the bridge debt, right? Because it's usually higher interest and it's really hard and fast on the back end. And so what we've been doing is partnering with community banks and allowing them to you know, see the vast majority of the investment, we bring the down payment money, then we grow the equity in the deal. And then our down payment and the equity allows us to play with or control the equity without having a ton of money in the deal. And eventually the goal is to refinance out the money that we've placed in the deal initially. Right. And then put that on some long-term debt that's non-recourse. Yep. yep. That, either that or sell it to somebody who wants it more than we do. <laughs> that, that, that's great man I, I like i like that the thought process of that because the money the way we finance the deal is is a big part of if we don't have the money we can't buy right so it's your so biggest a, yeah it's definitely the biggest part so you're gonna be between six to five um, percent to eighty percent right and that's that's a big part um so coming from c corporate america and doing joint ventures, it's obvious that you need to have some capitals, right? What are some of the avenues that a, say someone in corporate America who wants to exit and take on real estate as a business, what are some of the avenues that they can pull funds from? Yeah, so stop investing in your 401k because <laughs> if it's in that retirement account, you can't invest it in your own deal. And I think that's step one. Two, you know, if you get a bonus, I was able to get some pretty large bonuses along my journey. Don't spend it, put it in cash somewhere and hold it so that you have some capital. I did a number of different things. Hutch, I, I had credit lines that were available to me, unsecured credit lines that I could use, not credit cards, but credit lines. So, so the interest rate was a little bit lower. Um, some people I know do home equity lines of credit in order to get access to cash from the trapped equity in their home. Um, whole life insurance policies, if you're funding those, Usually you can take out against the cash value in those. And, you know, you know <laughs> if you want to get out bad enough, the thing that I love about real estate is you can turn on cash flow now. And so I've seen some people do something that others will call crazy and they cash out their 401k. They pay the taxes, cash out their 401k, and then put that money into real estate and put it to work. And people say, well, why would you do that? You got to save for retirement. Well, if you turn the cash flow on now and continue to grow the cash flow, you don't need a big old pile of money for, for retirement because you have it in the property. You have it in assets, income producing assets. And so, you know, Heath raised his hand. And said, yeah, yeah. No, I cashed out uh, my 401k with the, the contracting company I was working with before I transitioned to working for the, the government. You can take that, you turn on the cash flow now and say, you know, you do have, you know, for example, our 16 unit, my wife and I, 16 unit, you know, it's on a 30 year note uh, with the, the seller. And if we finance it for 30 years, basically, if we pay it off in 30 years, which is when I, I'd be able to use that money anyway for the 401k, I now have just as big of a chunk, if not, you know, comparable chunk, but I've had cash flow from that money the entire time. Um, so it's, it's, it's not like you're, you're taking a, chunk out and it's no longer protected. Uh, that's one of the reasons Hutch and I like real, uh, real estate is that you have a lot of that capital preservation uh, in your hard asset, uh, you know, so 
That was, that was one of the, my justifications for cashing out that 401k. I wanted to, to jump in and get started. So, yeah. So not advising, we're not advising anyone to cash out their 401k. Right. <laughs> but at, a, at the same time, when you do the math, we would, would definitely would tell everyone to sit down with their accountants, their CPA and go through the numbers, right? Because even going into a joint venture, you could do the cost segregation. If the price of the property, it, you know, it's, um, warrants that, right. You could do a cost segregation and, what you could have paid in taxes, right? You could be saving a lot of that um, whenever you file your taxes do, by doing the engineering cost segregation. You know, so the government wants us to one, provide housing, beautiful housing for our teachers. I'd be like President Trump, beautiful, spectacular housing. You're amazing. <laughs> these are the most beautiful apartments <laughs> we've ever had. And these are, these are for, you know, especially when you talk about, you know, providing housing for the firefighters and teachers. And I really admire that about you, Jerome, is that, you take care of the people, you're looking to take care of the people who are taking care of us. You know what I mean? And that get, over, got, that get overlooked way too, too often, you know? You know, so um, the government, like if we're providing jobs and if we're providing housing, then there are tax, tax benefits, you know? So definitely, if you listen to this and you want to cash out your 401k IRAs, definitely talk to your, your CPA and your, your tax advisor before you do that and work on the numbers, make sure it works out. Yeah, I'd also recommend not talking to your financial advisor because they're the ones who are probably going to want to keep. Like, I remember because uh, I also cashed out our, our Roth IRA just to get started. I'll probably start another one once um, we start getting more cash flow. But I remember whenever I told him, I was like, hey, cash me out everything. He was like, wait, what? Are, are you sure? He's like, you should leave it in. You know, we, we know what we're doing. And I was like, well, I'm sure you know what you're doing, but uh, I, I, I'd rather take control like it hasn't made any money. You, you, you keep taking like $1,500 every time you put it in new di different things. I mean, like that's, that's not helping me out. Like <laughs> I'd rather go buy a, a, a house or a, 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 you know, fourplex and, <laughs> and get the cash flow now and, and be in control of it myself. Uh, so but, he didn't, like don't, that. he didn't like that at all. No, no, he didn't. He didn't. And then like all those helpful uh, phone calls and emails uh, that we were having during that time just stopped, <laughs> you know, right? Because they're not making any money off of me anymore. So, yeah, we, we parted ways. But. Yeah. Oh, man. So, Jerome, you, you care about the teachers, you care about the firemen, but you also care about the, 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 the young man and young woman in our community, right? Um, are you doing any kind of mentor for the community? Um, you know, I, I sit on a few boards, right? So I sit on the board for, I chair a board for the civil and architectural engineering programs at That's North cool. Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Thank and so you. that gives me opportunity to engage with, you know, college students and help them get ready to go out into the workforce. Because, you know, while I am out of corporate America now, I think there is a place and a time and a lot of value from going through the system, right? And so going through getting good grades, getting a great job, earning some income, especially if you're not independent wealth, independently wealthy, I think it's extremely important that you go through and um, get those skill sets built up and learn from other people's abilities and um, contributions. Because you know, you can start and go through the school of hard knocks. And this is probably the thing that I learned the most in my transition. Like I didn't go through any of the programs in order to figure out how to do this. I, I went to podcast university and it was probably the most inefficient and effective way to learn what I learned. But, you know, I, I did get there eventually, but it wasn't without a ton of missteps. And so if you can learn from the mistakes of other people, I think you speed up your trajectory greatly. And for me, that is extremely important. Yeah. So you have a podcast that, that focuses on the de-romanticizing of, <laughs> of, um, <laughs> of, of, of real estate, right? By, uh, by acknowledging some of those missteps. What are some of those common missteps that you've seen while talking to guests on your show? Man, it's been extremely eye-opening because I knew there were issues just from my own mistakes. But to have top operators from all over the country come on and tell me about some of their biggest blunders, uh, I think, you know, everybody knows you can't pay too much, right? That's one of the overarching ones. But, you know, what does that actually mean? 
uh, I had Kenny Wolf come on. And he told me about not actually scheduling move outs the right way. He needed to go in and raise up one of the buildings on his property. And he could never get all four units vacant at the same time. And because of that, he lost revenue for three of the units over the course of the year, just trying to keep it vacant. And so that made him miss his first year performer and a bunch of other things. I had Brian Burt come on. He told me about having to write a $15,000 check each month for three years because he didn't want to go in and do a capital call with um, his partners or investors in the deal. Uh, I've had uh, a guy named uh, Sam Stidwell come on. He's, his first deal, first multifamily deal was a triplex. And he talks about all of the things that went wrong. He, he just simple and simple as trying to get through an exterminator can be a big deal when you get into the space and not really knowing what to do, or if you buy a property and you're cash strapped or, you know, s- stuff happens. Um, you know, my personal mistakes is modeling issues, right? I, I modeled something that my taxes were $10,000. I modeled them as a thousand dollars and got surprised at the end of the year because I thought they'd been paid by the attorney and they hadn't been. Um, what else have I done? Oh, <laughs> one. So on due diligence, we were um, we were walking through a property and I noticed that all the vents had been taped off in the unit. I was like, what in the world is going on here? We tried to turn it on and the unit wouldn't turn on. It just kept clicking off and like, this is really weird. We closed anyway. So then we start doing the inspection afterwards and the HVAC guy says, this is probably the disgusting thing I've ever seen. Um, there was a possum that fell into the on the heater coils in the HVAC unit, and so the, whenever you turn it on, it was a stench of death, right? Because you were searing that animal on the heating coils, and so we closed without actually figuring out what it was. And you know, just just being so excited and um, anxious to get into the deal often makes people make some mistake and they end up paying for things that they probably shouldn't pay for because those are problems that existed before you close. And so, you know, there, there's a ton of them. Um, we've, we've recorded probably uh, 35 or 40 episodes already. And we just started it after COVID and uh, you know, it's, it's been really eye opening and really enlightening for me. Yeah. So there's a common, there's a common um, saying that success leave clues, right? Um, so mi- mistakes also leave clues we can learn from those, right? And if we, if we learn from that, we definitely will be rewarded for, the, for being proactive, you know what I mean, by having a, um, a, a, a property that, that runs without any kind of crazy missteps, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, without question. I mean, I think the collective operating community doesn't want anybody to make the same mistake that they made right if mm-hmm. if i make a mistake you guys shouldn't make that same mistake because we've already uncovered that that's likely and i think the one that i probably should have mentioned that i haven't mentioned yet is just around raising money doing it legally and doing it without asking or pushing or pulling people into the space because that will make investors run away and so there's some really good lessons in throughout the podcast for syndication, we typically raise um, an abundance of cash up front to ensure that we can fully execute a business plan. Now, um, in some cases, right, the SEC allows you to, to raise um, possibly up to six months. Um, you have about six months after you close to, to raise capital in some cases, right, for syndication. How do you do that in a joint venture? I mean, it's closed when it's closed, right? I mean, there there is no hard and fast rule. I mean, because what's the difference between putting the money in on day one and having a capital call? Like you bring the money in as you need it. And I think you can change the ownership percentages if you need to, but if people can commit to putting the money in, if you don't actually need it day one, I don't know that it actually has to be in the bank account. Now that's a partner by partner negotiation. But with that said, like you can do lines of credit. There's a lot of different ways you can skin that cat so that as long as you have enough money to actually close the transaction, the money needed to do the renovations or to cover whatever uh, expenses you may have along the way can show up just before those expenses are incurred. Yeah, so I, I do like the aspect of more control and you can do a cap- capital call as needed from, from, the, from the JV partners. That's great. And so uh, as far as like setting up a JV, uh, do you have to go to an SEC attorney and get a PPM and all that? Should you run the partnership 
by an SEC attorney to make sure that you are doing a JV and not encroaching on some SEC regulations? How, how do you go about making sure your JV is in compliance with whatever SEC regulations might be out there for partnering up to take down a multifamily deal? Yeah, I am not an attorney, but... Right, 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 yeah. There From is, your experience uh, structuring your JVs, uh, right. how, does it, how does it work? Yeah, so what I'll say is there's a four... There's a four prong test that the SEC uses to differentiate um, whether something's a joint venture or syndication. And the answer to three of those questions, whether you're doing either one is yes. The last one is, is the profit or the proceeds um, the result of the operator or solely by the operator? And I think, I believe it's called the Moody test or something like that. So if the answer is everybody's relying on one person to the to create the results or the money, then yeah, it's a, it's a security and you need to be in compliance with uh, securities laws. If everybody has an active role, then it's, it's, it violates that one test. And so it is a joint venture, but talk to your attorneys and make sure that you're in compliance. And so from a documentation standpoint, you know, the, yeah, that's what I was going to ask next, as far as uh, setting up your LLCs that uh, is going to own the asset, is all the roles spelled out in, say, the operational agreement? No, but you do have an operating agreement. It talks about all the partners and probably somewhere along there, you lay out that people are expected to be active. And this is a joint partner or a joint venture uh, partnership and not a syndication or some of the other things, just so that it's in black and white when people are beginning to have those conversations or if you know you ever have to pull it back out. Right. So in, in sort of divvying up, because the, the toughest thing that people are able to talk about is money. And so say you have someone who has more money than the other, and you're always going to that partner in your JV for the money. Uh, how do you spell out exactly what people's contributions are monetarily to the, the project um, so that the person with all the money is better protected or, or, you know, at least there's understanding against the partners about where the money's coming from. Yeah. I mean, I think every, you've got to have those frank conversations and you got to have them up front, Right. And the protection piece comes in with the voting rights. And so certain amount of the ownership will be tied to equity. And what we typically do is, all right, if you put in X percent, that correlates with this much ownership in the deal, X percent of the equity. This correlate that correlates right. okay. the ownership in the deal. And so, you know, if you're bringing all the cash and the other person's doing all the work and you're participating in s certain joint pieces of it, like due diligence or financial reporting or any of the uh, meeting with property managers, any of the other things necessary to operate the property, then you also assign a weight to what that's worth to the deal. Um, people usually get credit and ownership for finding the deal, um, running due diligence. Um, there's usually some type of fee associated with capital events and some of the other stuff. So, you know, all that just, all of it's negotiable. There is no hard and fast rule for any of it. And, you know, once you guys put it, that, all that into the operating agreement um, and just kind of the rules and order of way that it, the project's going to work, um, once everybody agrees, you know, you're good to go. But you want to be very specific about expectations, especially on the need for additional capital, because if it comes up, you wanted them involved in the decisions along the way, right? You don't want to be off as an operator, you don't want to just be off doing something and then come back and say, Hey, I need more money. And like, well, I thought we had enough to begin with. Right. And the person's like, Oh, well, I did this, this, and this. <laughs> and there was no conversation along the way. You want people, you want to lay out, Hey, here's what the plan is. Here's what we think it's going to cost. And if there is some adjustment from what you thought it was going to cost, you need to have that conversation really early on so people can get prepared for it. Because I mean, you're usually not talking about hundred dollar checks or $500 checks. It's usually to the tune of five to, you know, $500,000 depending on the size of the deal. Oh man. Wow. Well, a <laughs> lot of great information. Oh, this has been awesome. But I think it's time for us now to get into the focus rounds. So 
focus round. It's an acronym. Uh, it's our five minute uh, rapid fire where we ask you questions and get to know you a little bit better. So F is for fun, O is for opportunity, C is for communication, U is for understanding, and S is for success. All right, so first question, Jerome, what do you do for fun? I like to go in caves. I like to go in wild caves. Really? You're a spelunker. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. That's pretty cool. I like oh, shoot. that. I've, I've, I've gone once or twice and, and uh, the, you know, with the helmet and, and, and going, going in, uh, a lot of the other things are just sort of bigger caverns that you can walk in behind, but, uh, but that's pretty cool. They are magnificent in there. Yeah. What is one opportunity, Jerome, that was a game changer for you? Oh, wee. I think the the biggest opportunity for me so far is the first one, right? Getting into a deal partnering with people who I didn't really have a long lasting deep relationship with, but it opened doors. So I was able, I was able to serve as asset manager on that first project. And because I was asset manager, my name was in the press release. And because my name was in the press release, I had banks from all over town. Some of them were the same 10 that told me no at the beginning, ready to invest and partner with me on the next deal. And so that opened up the doors for me to do everything else I've been doing. Oh man. I like that. I like that. How the banks that said no are like, Oh, hold it. Wait, wait, you actually did it. Well, here we got money for you. <laughs> oh man. All right. See communication. What is your most important communication tip? Ooh, transparency, right? A lot of people think, Hey, I don't want people to know what's going on. I don't want to tell bad news. If you're able to tell people the most uncomfortable things and have those tough conversations, then that will speed up the ability for people to trust you and not only speed it up, but deepen it. Hmm. Love it. All right. What is one thing you wish you understood earlier? <laughs> <laughs> um, that going to YouTube university was going to stifle my growth. Uh, I would probably be three or four times larger in assets under management and door count had I spent the time going through somebody's program. But because I did it the hard way and spent 40 hours a week listening to podcasts and reading books and uh, doing YouTube, uh, it took me a whole lot longer to grow to the place that I've grown. With that said, I've probably learned things that I wouldn't have learned the other way, but I know for a fact that it's not the most effective or efficient way to do it. And so I really want people to understand that there's real value in in doing some form of an education program for curated content. Got you. So you're solving the, the housing crisis for firemen, teachers, you know, work, the working force, right? The problem that you identify in education, how are you solving that problem? So, you know, part of it is putting money where my mouth is, right? So my family established the first full engineering scholarship at my alma mater and uh, just got a letter the other day from a young lady who was a recipient She's graduated now. She's working for Intel and she's also like a gym fellow. So she's working on a master's degree at Carnegie Mellon. So, you know, it's just creating an opportunity for people to get ahead. Right. I, I was fortunate enough to go to college on full scholarship and I know the difference that that had for me because I wasn't paying student debt. When I got out, I was able to buy a house and begin to start investing versus yes. trying to pay down debt. So, you know, just creating opportunities and making myself available for mentorship to answer questions and serve on various boards. You also have a mentorship program? Uh, for state. state education, yeah, we do some of that, yep. Very select, very, very select. Mm -hmm. Gotta have aligned values. So that, I, was, I was hoping you'd take that opportunity to do a plug for your mentorship program. So yeah. You edit this and cut it out or you don't want to? No, it's, it's fine. I just, you know, I, I don't come on platforms to. <laughs> okay. I got you. But uh, sorry, I, I try to give it a plug, make yeah. that plug. <laughs> Stand corrected. <laughs> love it. I love it. Um, all right. So S is for success. To what do you attribute your success? Hard work, man. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm from the school of Will Smith, right? Like, you might, we might get on the same treadmill, but you're going to get off before me. Like I'm going to outwork everybody. I'm, I'm no more talented than anybody else out there, but I, I will work harder than them. And I'm going to do whatever it takes in order to deliver the result. 
And so, you know, if you're, if you're committed to the result, I think you can have whatever you want for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that. Oh man. Well, Jerome, we wanted to thank you again so much for coming on today. I mean, this has been a wonderful episode and uh, I've just, I'm just tickled pink that you decided to come uh, speak with us. I'm, I'm just so happy and grateful. So um, Hutch, what do you think, man? Great episode. I don't think I'm tickle pink, dude. I think I'm maybe tickle blue. <laughs> it's just such things as tickle blue. <laughs> no, it, it was amazing, man. Every opportunity to talk to Jerome has is, is always been, been great and high opening and fulfilling, you know what I mean? So we really appreciate you, Jerome, whether it's um, virtual, hopefully one day we can meet you in person. Um, Oh, it's going to happen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you're listening to this and you haven't started following Jerome, you need to uh, make a LinkedIn account if you don't have one and go find this guy and follow him. It's, 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 it's going to improve your outlook on things and help with uh, getting the real hard, dirty facts about what you're trying to do. Because uh, nothing's better than transparency and honesty. And that's, that's, that's all I've ever found uh, about Jerome's character from all his content. So we appreciate you, man. And thank you again for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you and your community. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll close this out. I'm Dr. Heath Jones. And I'm Hutch, the Marine Investor. Out.